Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Right in the spirit, right, right up in here. Without even doing a formal introduction, his bio is in our program. But the word of God belongs right here. Would you receive at this time our speaker of the hour, Dr. E. Dewey Smith. Would you reach out and join hands? Would you join hands? We have a word of prayer. If you join hands this morning. God, you've been our help in ages past. You're our hope for years to come. You're our shelter from the stormy blast. You are our eternal home. We come this morning, oh God, to worship and to lift you, for you are the only true and living God. Give you glory for your compassions that fail not and your mercies that are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. How we honor you this morning for being faithful to us even when we've been so unfaithful to you. Give you glory because all we've needed your hand hath provided. We give you honor, we give you glory. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that walks and teaches and guides and leads now. We give you praise for this August body. Thank you for Radio 1. Thank you for the wonderful programming that emanates from Radio 1. We thank you for praise of FM 104.1. Thank you for the program director and all who serve in leadership to Provide inspiration and faith to your people. We pray your continued blessings upon this wonderful station. Thank you for these pastors, for their spouses. Thank you for giving us such treasure in earthen vessel. Thank you, God, for their struggles, for the anointing that rests on their lives. We give you glory for all they've endured for the cause of ministry. And we salute them today and give you praise for this wonderful gesture of just encouraging those who encourage us with regularity. God, would you now speak to our hearts and you know what we stand in need of. As we've come to honor these pastors, God, we all need you this morning and, and we've come with our own private issues and private concerns. And so would you meet us in the area of our need, oh God. If there's a void, would you fill it? If there's a pain, would you heal it? If there's purpose, would you reveal it? Speak in this place. Speak in this place. Speak in this place. And we give you glory, we give you honor now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise right there as you take your seats. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Let's thank God for praise 104.1. Let's praise God for praise. Come on, let's praise God for praise. FM programming. Kingdom. Kingdom programming. Now, I certainly thank God just for the privilege, and I'm honored immensely to be here, and certainly what a joy it is to be with the wonderful people of God and all who serve, and to certainly all the leaders and those who serve with praise, and to Pastor Donna McClurk, and what can we say about the legend? Isn't it, isn't it amazing? What an awesome man of God. Thank God for his consistency of his gift and his anointing and how he represents the kingdom, and, and one of my personal favorites, Latisse Crawford. Isn't she amazing? Beautiful spirit, beautiful voice, and just thank you for the authenticity, and certainly I'm just honored to be here with all of you. Uh, happy birthday, Bishop. 71 years, years young. God has kept you. We honor you this morning, you and co-pastor Susie. I've been praying as what God will have me to share with you today, something that will be relevant, and certainly this is amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed, but I was a little taken aback because we have praise 97.5 in Atlanta, and we've never done anything like this. And so this is a wonderful paradigm. I really think it's a wonderful paradigm for, for stations. Just so much, so much negativity comes about the church. And so much negative things are in media about pastors. And so we get an opportunity to show that without pastors, without the church in our community, and so many people are trying to kill the church and anti-faith and anti-pastor. I'm so glad I was raised in the church. I still love the church. I still love the men and women of God. You all thank God for that. This is a great paradigm of how we should honor the church. There's a passage in Acts chapter 12. 
I want you to read it in your leisure. I was praying on the way here this morning on the plane. God, what, what can I share for pastors? And thank you, Pastor Donnie, for giving me confirmation. That's a passage. I'm going to read in Acts 12, a familiar passage. It's in Acts 12, and I'm going to read verse number 5. I'm going to read it from my devotional Bible, the uh, message translation. And it reads thusly in Acts 12 and 5, All the time that Peter was under heavy guard in the jailhouse, the church prayed for him most strenuously. Then the time came for Herod to bring him out for the kill. That night, even though shackled to two soldiers, one on either side, Peter slept like a baby. Verse 6, then the time came for Herod to bring him out for the kill. The same night, even though shackled to two soldiers, one on either side, Peter slept like a baby. And on this prayer breakfast, that's a word for all of us. I want to lift that tonight for each of you and for all of us. Sleep like a baby. Sleep. Sleep like a baby. I know you had your breakfast. I don't want you to do that right now. I mean, that's, that's metaphorical. Sleep like a baby. I'm always excited to get an opportunity to come to the DMV, particularly to the Prince George's County area, because one of my favorite places in the entire world is here. Pastor Dunny alluded to one of such places in his comments. One of my favorite places in the world is right nearby. It's called Six Flags. <laughs> I love coming to the DMV, and particularly this area. Rarely do I come to this area without making a trip by Six Flags. Even though I'm grown now, and even though I should let some things go, Paul said, when I became a man, I put away some childish things. You got to pray for me. I'm still in process. <laughs> Something exhilarating about Six Flags, the roller coaster rides, the sights, the smells, the sounds uh, about the roller coasters, mind bender, scream machine, Batman, free fall, something, <laughs> something wonderful, Space Mountain and, and Disney World, something amazing about roller coasters. And unfortunately, it's a little too cold to visit Six Flags this time. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe y'all don't get the memo. It is March. And uh, so ice on the ground. So no six flags this time for me. But, but you can help me, I believe, if you just uh, allow me to step out on the wings of probability and lend me your own theaters of your cerebral cortex. And we're going to transform this room from a banquet hall to six flags <laughs> over the Holy Spirit. This morning, we, we're going to, Imagine that we're getting ready to take a roller coaster ride, not on the mind bend or the scream machine or Space Mountain or the Hulk, but we're taking a roller coaster ride through the book of Acts. The architect of this ride is the Holy Ghost. The conductor of this ride is Dr. Luke. Those of us who are what Luke's called a Theophilus, a lover of God, then you are eligible to get on the ride. If you are a lover of God, you've met the requirements of eligibility. I don't, I don't care how short you are. You don't have to be 48 inches tall. <laughs> Does not matter about your age. You can be with child, diabetic. If you are a lover of God, you already met the ridership prerequisites. Come and join me as we take a journey through the book of Acts. This morning, we start out on the plateau on this roller coaster ride because Jesus the Christ has just been resurrected from the dead with all power in his hand. So we started in the apex, an acre of zenith, because he had got up with all power. But we take a quick jerk because he goes back to heaven, and for a brief while there was no presence of the Godhead on earth to make his official dispensation known. For God the Father was on the throne. Jesus the Christ had ascended to sit at the right hand, but the Holy Spirit had not yet come. So we take a jerk down the ride. Hold on to the bars tight. We come back up the ride because it was on the day of Pentecost when the 120 were gathered in the same place. And suddenly 
there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty when they filled the house where they were sitting. They began to speak with new tongues. So we come back up the ride. But hold on a minute because 15 different provinces had come for the festival of Passover who made fun of the early church. When they saw them proclaiming the glossolalia, speaking in tongues, they said, these folk must be drunk. Mockery of the saints of God. So we come down the ride. But hold on, we come back up because Peter said, yes, we are drunk. But this has nothing to do with Hennessy and Patron. We, we've had an overdose of the Holy Ghost. And I wish I had somebody on a Saturday morning who's ever had an overdose of the Holy Ghost. They come back up the ride. Preachers, 3,000 a so, a sermon and 3,000 folks get saved. We come up the, but now we come back down the ride. Because it was around 3 p.m. Peter and John were going to the temple by the gate beautiful and saw a lame man. So we see handicapped in the holy book. Is it amazing how you can have anointing in the church, but right outside are lame people in proximity of the place of power. That's a sad reality. We come down the ride, but we come back up the ride because Peter said, hey, we know you're looking for the arms. We don't have money for you. It's hard out here for pimps and for beggars, but that's something we do have. We have Jesus. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk the man. So we come back up the ride. But now we come back down the ride because Peter and John were thrown in jail after bringing deliverance to that man who had been lame by the gate. But we come back up the ride because now we see generosity in the church. It was Barnabas, host son of consolation, who sold his property. He'd be accused of socialism. He didn't want a tax break for the rich of his own uh, demographic. He gave all he had and laid it at the feet of the apostles and distribution was made to everybody who had a need. So we see generosity in the church, not just a tax break for the rich. He wanted everybody to be blessed. We come up the ride. But then you, we come back down the ride because there's a man and his wife, Ananias and Sapphira. Who, who were jealous and wanted to get credit. So they sold their property, kept back some of the proceeds for themselves, and lied to the apostles in church and fell dead right within the span of three hours right in the church. We see death in the church. We see a, an ecclesiastical homicide right in the church. A couple dies, we come down the ride. But we come back up the ride. Hold on, because after they died, the church grew more. How many of you know sometimes God got to kill folk and get folk out of the way in order for the church to be what the church needs to be? We come back up the ride. But now we come back down the ride because there arose a murmuring amongst the Grecians and the Hebrews because the widows had been neglected in the daily administration. The so apostle said, it is not a reason we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Look ye out and find you seven. Not just any kind of seven, but make sure they have faith. They have some faculties and they have some fire. Make sure they have some sense and some spirit and some substance. Don't just give them fire because they have fire but no sense. They'll start a fire. And they chose seven and the church grew and the word of God increased greatly. As we come back up the ride, but now we come back down the ride. Because Stephen, Stephen, the first deacon of the church, preached one sermon to open the doors of the church. He has been commissioned, killed, all within the framework of three chapters. Now we come down the ride because Stephen has died. And now Paul is going around trying to lock up anybody who's a part of this movement called the way. But on his way to Damascus to hunt the church of the Lord Jesus, the hunter became the hunted. God knocked him off of his horse and changed his life. And now he's blind for three days. We come down the ride. And this morning we're still down. We're down this morning. I, I didn't mean to tell you this. Hold, hold on to your stomach. We're down. We're down this morning, number one, because there is persecution by a politician. Uh, Luke tells us, verse one, about that time Herod the king. Stretch forth his hands to vex certain of the... We should be familiar with that name, Herod. A part of an influential New Testament family called the Herodian family. We saw that family the first time in the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 2. We have to go back before that to really understand this family called the Herodian family. The progenitor of that family is a guy whose name was Edomene Antipater, who was a friend of Julius Caesar along with Claudius and Mark Antony. He helped to execute... Julius Caesar, he's an Edomite by culture. He has a son by the name of Herod. And after the fall of Pompey, they allowed Herod to become the Jewish king over several Jewish provinces. He, he's called Herod the Great, the son of Antipater. It was that Herod the Great who was living at the time when the wise men came from the east to worship baby Jesus when they'd seen his star in the east. He's a wicked king. 
he, he, he got where he got because of the inheritance he received from his father. Uh, he, he's known for building great buildings to put in, in his name. He marries a sister by the name of Mary Amney, who was a Hasmonean by culture. Or a tradition tells us he had his wife put to death. Uh, another legend says he looked at his mother-in-law. And because she reminded him of his wife, he put her to death. Now, fellas, I'm not trying to give y'all no ideas. I'm just telling you the history of the Herodian family. He has two sons, Aristopolis and Achillean. It's believed because he felt they were trying to usurp his authority. He had his own boys put to death. It was said about Herod, it's better to be one of his pigs than to be one of his sons. He was the king, according to Matthew 2, and the wise men came from the east. They asked him a question, where is he? That is born king of the Jews. We've seen his star in the east. We've come to worship him. But he didn't want to worship Jesus. Why? Because Herod had been appointed king by the Romans. Jesus had been anointed king by the righteous. The wise men came after they found Jesus. And the angel told them, don't go back to the east way of Herod, but go back a different way. And when Herod discovered he was mocked by the wise men, he issued an edict to kill all baby boys who were two years of age and under, and while he was trying to kill the baby boys, Jesus was taken to Egypt and hidden in Egypt while Herod was alive. This is how vexed he was. It was said by Josephus in his antiquities that Herod was so evil. He said, at the moment I die, I need somebody to go through the land and just kill people because I need somebody to cry when I die. Well, he has a, he has a grandson by the name of Agrippa. Well, Agrippa was sent to Rome because they thought Herod was going to try to kill him as well. He sent to Rome, and there he was in Rome. He goes to school with someone whose name was Claudius. And that fellow becomes a Roman emperor. And when he becomes a Roman emperor, he elevates Agrippa to become the king over Jerusalem provinces. And so at the time of our text, uh, Acts 12, now about that time, Herod the king, this is not the same Herod that's in Matthew chapter 2. This is the great-grandson of Antipater, the grandson of Herod the Great, the son of Aristarchus or Achillean. And so he is the grandson of Herod the Great, the son of Achillean or Aristarchus. And here's what is interesting. He's going around, Luke says, to vex certain of the church. Verse 2 tells us he has beheaded James, the brother of John. And because he saw it please the Jews, he apprehended to take Peter as well. He's going around like a wild Boar. He's going around like a wild animal. And what is interesting here is that this persecution, number one, it is in his pedigree. Amazingly, his great-grandfather supported the death of Julius Caesar. His grandfather, Herod the Great, was a violent man. His father dies a violent death. Four generations, he shipped to Rome so he would not be around the violence of the previous generations. He's in a different socialization. He's not around a different environment totally. But what is interesting here is although he has been sent to Rome away from that violence, now that he's grown, the same stuff that had been perpetuated in three previous generations is now a part of his own existential journey. We've got to be careful to understand that even as leaders, as people of God, that there's a thing called dysfunction. And many of us have have had to deal with systemic, generational dysfunctions in our lineage. And we wonder about the things that we struggle with even within the body of Christ. As Pastor McClurkin was talking earlier, this week has been a difficult week. We, We shared last year and he encouraged me so much. Within the framework of four weeks, I had my godmother to die. Next week, my mother died. Three days later, my best friend died. Three weeks after my mother died, my sister died. Five days after my sister died, my brother had a stroke. Monday of this week, my oldest sister, only living sister, was in the hospital. Just came home yesterday with the same condition that my mom and my sister died with just last year. Thirteen months ago, had to bury my mother and my sister, 21 days apart. And I began to ask myself the question, God, what is it that's going on in my own situation? And God said something to me that just because you're anointed 
does not mean that there can't be a tax, not just on you, but on everything that's connected to you. And that's why we've got to start as the people of God praying some things off of our leaders and off of our children because, because the pastors can be attacked. That's why so many of our pastor's children are now being attacked because they have the connection but don't have the same anointing. But somebody can testify that just because it was in my lineage, somebody help me. Just, just because my mama struggled with cancer, y'all not talking to me here. Just because the previous generation in the church struggled uh, does not mean that that's going to be my lot. As a matter of fact, I told my son yesterday before I left, I want y'all to know I'm the last Smith male fool in this family because in the name of Jesus every struggle that I've dealt with I speak that the curse is broken over your life I wish I had somebody right now who can testify the curse has been reversed there, there is an attack on those of us who are in clergy that's why since November 2013, we've had 21 clergy persons to take their lives of all denominations, of all races. Why? Because there's a war on the men and women of God. The enemy has sought to bring battle and destruction, but somebody can testify. That's why we're here this morning. Not to pull each other down, but to understand that today some dysfunction will stop in our life. And so, here he is. His persecution is in his pedigree, but it is also uh, in his psychology. He's beheaded James, the brother of John. And the text says, because he saw it please the Jews. He proceeded further to take Peter. He arrest Peter. After beheading James, but after he beheads James, the Jews were happy. And so in order to please them further, he goes to incarcerate Peter. Leaders, you got to be careful when your decision and your vision has the intention of pleasing people. Just because something is politically correct does not mean it's in the plan of God. And many of us have missed our assignment because we want people to be pleased and accepting to who we are. The best thing you can be delivered from other than sin is delivered from the opinions and trying to please other people who don't understand who you are. And that's what more pastors need to walk in that certainty that if God has called you to ministry, that regardless whether the boys call you to hang out, if you never become a bishop, a pope, or a cardinal, if you always got to be just a servant, walk in your servanthood. You don't have to spend money that you don't have. You're not helping me here. And many of us try to bless and please other people. And so we get 50 members and make 48 of them I'm a bearers, trying to be something we are not. We Come on, y'all don't help me here. We buy 600 bin off of a Toyota salary trying to make people be pleased with us. But when you have the anointing on your life, you're satisfied that if I, ne if I never have more than 100 members, uh, that's 100 more than I deserve to be preaching to. God, let me honor you and not people. Be free with who you are. Stop trying to impress. We got to stop trying to impress people because it's a sign of an inner dysfunction. When you understand who your, your assignment and what your assignment is, I'm not making diabolic decisions because I want people to be pleased. But my prayer is, God, would you please honor my sacrifice? God, would you please see my efforts? Because I've made you the audience of one. And if my work, if my ministry does not honor you, then what does it, only what you do for Christ. And so he, that's persecution by a politician and now, Peter has gone from the Pentecostal preacher to the Palestinian prisoner. So there's persecution by a politician, but while the politician is persecuting, people are praying. 
Verse 5 says, the same night. Peter had been delivered over to 16, four quarters of soldiers. It says, but the church met at John Mark's mother's house. Mary's house. The text says, they prayed. The message Bible says, they prayed most strenuously. When I did some linguistic analysis on that word prayer, it's interesting because the normal word for prayer in the Greek is the word called prosuke. The preposition pros, meaning face. The suffix, the verb, the noun, wish. It means to bring your wish or your desire to the face of the Father. Prosuke means to go upward in worship, to go downward in warfare, to go outward in work. That, that's the normal word that we use for prayer, prosuke. But that's not the word that Luke uses here. It's not the word prosuke. It's a rare Greek word. That it, it's called ektinos. It's interesting because it's different from uh, prosuke, upward in worship, downward in warfare, outward in work. Ektinos is interesting because it means to stretch out. Mm -hmm. Okay. So sometimes when I'm praying, I can go upward. But other times, something can be so debilitating. I don't feel like going upward. I just got to get on my face and stretch out. Is there anybody been through something that's been so painful in your life? Now, now let me talk to the real folks. I know some of y'all got the testimony. You're too blessed to be stressed. To anoint it to be disappointed, you know, and it's hallelujah, blessed in the city, blessed in the field. But can I tell y'all, when I had to bury my mama and my sister and preach both eulogies three weeks apart, I didn't want nobody to tell me I'm praying for you. Y'all not going to feel me here. I, when my mama left me and didn't tell me she was leaving, I didn't feel like hearing all the time, God is good. Matter of fact, people ask me, are you going to preach tomorrow? No, I'm not going to preach tomorrow. You preach. We need to see your face. I'm going to do what y'all do. I'm going to stay home and grieve for a minute. Okay, let me, let me, let me, let me talk to somebody. Because every pastor was called and said, man, some stuff you just got to preach your way through it. Just go to the pulpit and preach your way through it. And God said, no. And God, the Holy Spirit said, son, I don't need you to be a pastor. Right now, I want you to be a son. I wish I had somebody. And that's the problem with too many of us. We try to act all the time like we got it all together. And we try to, and we never get help. Some of us are struggling in our marriages, struggling with our children, but we got our divine side showing. But until you deal with the real stuff on the inside. It, it was Jane Baldwin who said, while it is true that everything that is faced can't be fixed, it is also true. That nothing can be fixed until it's faced. I had to find myself asking God some questions. I had to tell him, God, I, I love you. I feel, I, I know I'm called, but I'm broken right now. I, I, I know I should be rejoicing because mama is on the other side. My spirit knows she's in heaven. But I'm a mama's boy. My emotions... And I'm so glad I had some leaders and some people who weren't so personality driven. Uh, who understood, Pastor, if you got to take you a couple of days off, a couple of Sundays off, we got this for you. We'll handle this for you while you get away and take care of yourself. Because I realized something. Many of us won't get away because you think the church needs you. It's really arrogance, but it's really insecurity. Because if you think the church can't make it without you, do me a favor. Die. Somebody help me right here. They'll put a black cloth on your chair, call your name for 30 days, and have a new preacher in six months. You better take care of you and your family. Take care of your soul. I, I felt like I was locked up by grief, locked up by pain, locked up by sadness. But I had somebody who could ectinos, who could stretch out. And what the pastor needs now uh, uh, 
It's more armor bearers and less Paul bearers. An armor bearer helps them make it, helps them make it to a destiny. A Paul bearer slowly carries them to their death. What the pastor needs now is less instigators and more intercessors. What the pastor needs now is more folk who will get off the telephone, I mean the telephone, and get down your knees and say, God, keep our leader lifted. Keep the leader's arms lifted up. The pressure, the weight, the strain, mortgage and payroll and refereeing between Negroes. Y'all not helping me here tonight. You don't understand what I'm trying. Some of your pastors are stressed to the max, but got to keep smiling. But what, what do you do when the pastor can't pray for him or herself? When one of the saints go mature enough to meet at Mary's house and say, when the pastor's going through, we got you. We're going to hold you down until you get yourself, until God brings healing to bring you back to the place. And so Peter... Peter is bound, but prayer is loosed. Yeah, politicians were persecuting. People were praying. But lastly, Peter is peaceful. I'm done. Verse 6, the same night. Verse 6, message Bible. Heaven was going to bring him forth for the kill. He has, he's bound between two soldiers. One on either side. But that same night, Peter slept like a baby. Just seen Stephen Stone. Just heard James got beheaded. And the next night, this is the last night in Herod's mind of Peter's life. He's on death row. But has enough peace. He sleeps like a baby. If Peter can sleep while on death row, what's your excuse for the little mess you're going through? If Peter can handle death row and have peace, then perpetrating preachers, mean mothers, crazy and confused choir members, devilish deacon, tricky trustees, ugly acting ushers, and burdensome board of directors. You ought to be having a peace where you trust God. And I had to ask Peter a question. It was an imaginary conversation I had with Peter this morning. I said, Peter, can you help me? I'm going to talk to pastors and people. Can you tell me, how are you such a paradigm for peace? How can you sleep? And then I start to look at this scenario, and I imagine that night. Look with me. I believe everybody that night in Jerusalem was wide awake. Y'all see it? Look at Herod. I believe Herod was wide awake thinking about the prestige he was going to get as soon as he killed Peter. So insecure, he needed the affirmation. He knew they liked it when he beheaded James, so he thinks when he kills Peter, they may make him the next Caesar. He, oh, look at him. He's wide awake. I believe the people were wide awake. Like children night before Christmas trying to eliminate this movement called the way the Jews, I believe, were wide awake. I believe the jailers were wide awake. Many of them were awake because there was a Roman law, the Code of Justinian, which said if any prisoner ever escaped, the guard had to take the place of the prisoner. I believe, look at those jailers going up to the Starbucks on Jerusalem Boulevard, getting an espresso and a coffee, trying to keep their eyes. Y'all see, I believe, I believe the jailers were wide awake. I know the church was awake. Luke just told you they were down at Mary's house praying all night. For Peter, I believe Herod was awake. I believe the Jews were awake. I believe the jailers were awake. I know the church was awake. But Peter. One more time. I'm almost. I said, I believe that I believe Herod was awake. I believe the Jews were awake. I believe the jailers were awake. I know the church was awake. But Peter. The one who is on death row. Pastor Peter had enough peace. I don't know what you're going through this morning, Pastor, but I came to tell you, peace is not the absence of trouble. It's serenity and tranquility in the midst of it. Somebody help me here. And so I had to ask Peter, Peter, how 
do you sleep, dude? He said, here's how I slept. I slept, number one, because I had the past perspective of God. I said, what's that, Peter, the past perspective of God? He said, you know, I'm a preacher. But one day I was with Jesus. He took the scroll. He turned to the scripture where it says, behold, he that keepeth Israel shall either sleep nor slumber, which means God going to be awake. <laughs> so since God going to be woke, I might as well. God don't need me keeping him company. Won't you shake somebody's hand and say, why are you up at night when you've got the eternal surveillance of God? So since God going to be woke, you might as well go to sleep. Woo! Because his eye is on the sparrow. And, and so Peter said, uh, I can sleep because I had a past perspective of God. But secondly, he said, uh, I can sleep because I had the past promise from God. Past promise? Peter said, yes, the past promise from God. I said, what's that, Peter? He said, well, if you read St. John chapter 21, around verse 11 through around verse 17, I said, yeah. He said, well, if you read John 21, uh, after I denied Jesus, when he got back up from the dead, he looked at me and he said, Peter, you love me? I said, yes. He said, well, go feed my sheep. You love me? Yes. He asked me that three times. Then he said, Peter? I said, yes, Lord. He said, when thou shalt get old. It's in red. Read it. John 21, 11 through 18. When thou shalt get old. Some of y'all still sleeping from the breakfast. Peter, when thou shalt shout. Not a homily. Shout. Not a simile. Shout. Not hyper hyperbole. Shout. Not imaginatively. Shout. Not hypothetically. Shout. Not imaginatively. Shout. Not figuratively. Shout. Not metaphorically. Shout. Not parenthetically. Shout, not hyperbolically. Shout, literally. When you shout, get old. So Peter said to himself, to himself, said, I, uh, I, I know I'm in jail now. And I know Herod wants to kill me like he did James with the sword. But, but I remember. He told me, I shout. And right now, I'm about mm, 42. That ain't old yet. So since I got the promise that he told me I would get old. Shake somebody's hand and say, I don't know what you're going through. But you got to remember what he said. He said no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper he said upon this rock i will build my church when you got his word you can go to sleep at night can i tell you something can i can i can i, can I mess with your theology i would rather be in his word than be in heaven I said, I'd rather be in his word than be in heaven. Why do it? Because the book said, when heaven and earth are passed away, his word shall stand forever. Look at somebody and say, get you a word. And when I got depressed this week with my sister's heart failure, I got a word, thou shalt live. Ooh, and not die. Let, 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 let me, let me. So, 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 so you. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. You. Touch two people, say, get you a word. Woo!
And let me tell you something, preachers, the problem with us is sometimes we preach something that we don't believe. And maybe that's why the struggle comes. Because God wants to move us from the theoretical to the experiential. Peter, I'm finished. At the past perspective of God, a past promise from God. But third and finally, he said, I I, I got peace because I got past provision in God. I'm done. So what you mean, Peter? He said, well, I'm in chapter 12 right now, and I'm about to be killed, according to Herod. And I was getting ready to lose it in anxiety and fear. But some hit me. I said, what hit you, Peter? He said, well, in Acts chapter 3, John and I were going to the temple. We saw a lame man asking alms at the gate. And we were used by God to bring this man healing. After that man got healed, they threw me in jail. Read Acts chapter 4. So Peter said, I was, I was about to lose it. Because Herod going to get me. But right before I lost it, my mind went back to Acts chapter 4. Eight chapters ago. <laughs> I was just in a similar predicament. So my emotions started messing with me, but I, but I looked around the cell and I said to myself, to myself, said I, uh, this looks familiar. I've been here before. And the same God who brought me out in Acts chapter 4, he's the same God who can bring me out In Acts chapter 12, let me talk to somebody. While you worried about Acts chapter 12, look back over the past chapter of your life. Some of you can't enjoy this service because you've been broke. Let me see you lift your hand. You've been broke before. You've been broke before. Never had, yeah, so, some of you all be, be like me. Lift both hands, your feet. Barbara, somebody else's hands because you've been there before. But here's the thing. Guess what? But you didn't miss no meals. He provided for you before. And guess what? If he did it, you know, can I be honest? Can I be transparent? I'm done. I, I've been losing it since November. I've been concerned about the leadership of our nation. I, 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 I'm also in law and I'm very concerned about uh, the political arena and policies, how it affects our people. I've been very concerned about who's going to be in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And some of the stuff that I've seen kept me up at night. Y'all got to pray for your boy. And I've been having a hard time dealing with some of the stuff that I've been seeing, dripping. And God convicted me. He said, boy, do you think this is the first time that black folk in America have dealt with craziness in the White House? Do you think this this is the first time that we've had to deal with racism and sexism and classism? Do you think this is the first time? But guess what? No matter what y'all went through. In the transatlantic, coming from West Africa, coming through the slave trade. Y'all not feeling me here. Uh, going through slavery, reconstruction. You fought in every war. World War I, World War II. You came through Jim Crow. You came through Plessy versus Ferguson. You came through Brown and Board versus Education. You came through the Civil Rights Movement. And if he's taking care of your folk for 400 years. I'm finished. He's the same God who will take care of us uh, right now. I got to close here, but is there anybody in the room this morning who can look back over your shoulder and say, I am in a bad situation. I might be in a bad situation, but if God did it for me in the past, then I believe he can do it one more time. Shake your neighbor's hand and say, neighbor, it is a Saturday morning prayer breakfast. And I speak over your life. And uh, that the Lord is getting ready to do it again. He's getting ready to heal you again. 
He's getting ready to make a way again. He's getting ready to dry your tears again. He's getting ready to bring about programs in the ministry. He's doing it again. Well, if you believe he's doing it again, you will not wait until the battle is over. But ooh, you ought to shout right now. Because you got to experience this with God. I'm taking my seat. Got to get back to Atlanta. But why don't you shake a neighbor's hand and say, neighbor, I've got good news for you. And the good news is uh, weeping may endure for the night. But ooh, joy is coming in the morning. Come on, shake your neighbor's hand and say, neighbor, we're getting ready to praise him for what he's doing again. He's getting ready to do it in your life. So do me a favor, lift up your hand and say, do it again. Heal me again. Make a way again. Bring deliverance again. Won't it do it? Come on, pastors, get you some rest. Get you some rest.